Thank you very much for your kind introduction. You can't hear me in the back row. Just put up your hands. I can't see you, so it's fine. I think you'll be all right. Usually, uh, I don't even need the microphones. My four um, lectures hold together, so I hope a few of you turn up on Thursday. The overall theme could be uh, described briefly as religious revivals, maritime Baptists, and Henry Alline. In 1973, I thought that I would, after the publication of my Nova Scotia's Massachusetts, finally abandon my research interest in Henry Alline and revolutionary Nova Scotia and begin serious scholarly work on the Upper Canadian Loyalists. As far as I was concerned, in 1973, my work on Alline had led to a cul-de-sac, and I was determined, moreover, to escape the long shadow that J.B. Brebner still cast over all my historical writing. I had, in my earlier work, found it very difficult to come to grips with Alline's pietism and spirituality since, among other things, his religiosity raised fundamental questions about the essential nature of my own Christian faith. In my attempt to escape some of the implications of my changing religious views, I had turned in the late 1960s to social psychology and intellectual history, determined to fit Aline and myself into the seemingly acceptable and sophisticated scholarly paradigm. For me, all historical writing is basically autobiographical in nature, and certainly my writing has often painfully reflected my own psychological, intellectual, and religious search for meaning and stability. Yet soon after abandoning Aline and revolutionary Nova Scotia, I found that Upper Canadian loyalism did not really capture my imagination, and this fact both exacerbated my sense of frustration and my sense of academic isolation. I therefore welcomed the opportunity in the autumn of 1976 to reassess Alline's career when I addressed the Divinity Day audience, McMaster Divinity College. In that paper, Henry Alline and the Canadian Baptist Tradition, I underscored the fact that my earlier work on Alline had, for a variety of reasons, underestimated the importance of his of his religiosity and mysticism. And this reassessment of Aline persuaded me that I would never be at peace with myself until I carefully re-examined Aline's career and the impact he had both on the Maritimes and on neighboring New England. Preparing the Atlantic provinces and the problems of Confederation for the Task Force and Canadian Unity in 1977 and 78, and writing with Kevin Quinn, in 1979 and 80, the redeemed the Lord say so, only served to convince me further that I was right in my determination to return to Aline. In the summer of 1980, I was finally ready to re-examine Aline and the Alanite tradition. My Haywood lectures, together with my new light letters and songs, have taken shape during the past three-year period. These lectures and the new light volume will reveal, I think, that I now regard evangelical religion in a radically different manner than I once did. And furthermore, I no longer consider it to be academic suicide to view the evangelical tradition in a sympathetic way to argue that it is essential for Canadian scholars, both inside and outside the tradition to fit it carefully within the context both of maritime and Canadian historical development, not to do so, in my view, is both to distort the past and to distort the present. Henry Alline was a man almost larger than life, and he has cast a long shadow over the religious development of the New England Nova Scotia region until the present day. His contemporaries regarded him as Nova Scotia's George Whitfield, 
as a powerful instrument of the Almighty, charismatic and uniquely spiritual. Historians of the 19th and 20th centuries have been almost to a person overwhelmed by Alain's mystical theology, his creative powers, and his unusual ability to communicate to others his profound sense of Christian ecstasy. Alain was born in Newport, Rhode Island in 1748 and moved in 1760 with his parents to Falmouth in the Minas Basin region of Nova Scotia. Like most young people in the settlement, he was brought up in a pious and Calvinist atmosphere. There was little in his rural upbringing in Nova Scotia that would even suggest that Alain would develop into the province's most gifted preacher and most prolific hymn writer. He was widely known in his community only because of his outgoing personality and his skill in the art of canning and currying. In the early months of 1775, the 27-year-old Alain experienced a profound spiritual and psychological crisis, a crisis that, when resolved, would provide the turning point in his life. Alain's conversion, his traumatic new birth, was significantly shaped by his finely developed morbid introspection, his fear of imminent death, and by the considerable pressure he felt to commit himself one way or another during the early months of the American Revolutionary struggle. Alain's conversion, it should be stressed, was the central event of his life, and he felt compelled to persuade others to share in his spiritual ecstasy. One perceptive 19th century observer noted that Alain was, in quotes, converted in a rapture, and ever after he sought to live in a rapture, and judged of his religious conditions by his enjoyments and raptures. Alain's graphic description of his conversion experience, it is noteworthy, captured the attention of William James, who, in his variety of, of religious experience, published in 1916, used it as a classic example of the curing of a sick soul. Alain noted in his journal, February the 13th, 1775, when about midnight I waked out of sleep I was surprised by a most alarming call, as with a small, still voice, as it were through my whole soul, as if it spoke these words, how many days and weeks and months and years has God been striving with you, and you have not yet accepted, but remain as far from redemption as at first, and as God has declared that his spirit shall not always strive with man. What if he would call you no more, and this might be the last call, as possibly it might be? What would your unhappy doom, bo doom be? Oh, how it pierced my whole soul, and caused me to tremble in my bed and cry out for a longer time. Oh, Lord God, do not take away thy spirit. Oh, leave me not, leave me not, give me not a, over to hardness of heart and blindness of mind. For over a month, Alain struggled to find peace of mind, or as he put it, to be stripped of self-righteousness. And then just when it seemed that he had reached the mental breaking point, he experienced what seemed to him to be the profound delights of spiritual regeneration. He described the beginnings of his conversion experience in this way. Oh, help me, help me, cried I, thou redeemer of souls, and save me, or I am gone forever. And the last word I ever mentioned in my distress, for the change was instantaneous, was, O Lord Jesus Christ, thou canst this night, if thou pleasest, with one drop of thy blood, atone for my sins, and appease the wrath of an angry God. At that instant of time, when I gave up all to him to do with me as he pleased, and was willing that God should reign in me and rule over me at his pleasure, redeeming love broke into my soul with repeated tears, with such power that my whole soul seemed to be melted down with love. The burden of guilt and condemnation was gone. Darkness was expelled. My heart humbled and filled with gratitude, and my will turned of choice after the infinite God. My whole soul seemed filled with the divine being. As far as the ecstatic Alain was concerned, the black, gloomy despair of his acute depression and morbid introspection had been miraculously removed. 
My whole soul, he proclaimed, that was a few minutes ago groaning under mountains of death, wading through storms of sorrow, racked with distressing fears, and crying to an unknown God for help, was now filled with immortal love, soaring on the wings of faith, freed from the chains of death and darkness, and crying out, My Lord and my God, thou art my rock and my fortress, my shield and my high tower, my life, my joy, my present and my everlasting portion. The sudden transforming power of spiritual regeneration, the new light, new birth, compelled Aline to declare, and these emotionally charged words would provide the cutting edge of his Christian message until his death in 1784. Oh, the infinite condescension of God to a worm of the dust. For though my whole soul was filled with love and ravished with the divine ecstasy beyond any doubts or fears or thoughts of being then deceived, for I enjoyed a heaven on earth and it seemed as I were wrapped up in God. Over and over again in his journal and published sermons and pamphlets and his hymns and spiritual songs, Aline referred to his having been ravished by the divine ecstasy and also to his having been married to his Savior by the redeeming power of the Holy Spirit. Divine love had overwhelmed him to such an extent that he viewed his own experience as being the pattern set for all others. It is not surprising, therefore, that Aline expected his followers to share the intense ecstasy of spiritual rapture, the central new light experience, which he had so recently experienced and which he regarded as being the only satisfactory means of regeneration. Aline's traumatic conversion experience was, was obviously the critically important event of his life, and this point, I think, merits repetition. His description of it in his journal, available and distributed in manuscript form as early as 1789 and in print in 1806, and in his two mites, some of the most important and most disputed points of divinity, first published in Halifax in 1781, provided a pattern for his disciples to appropriate, to follow, and to attempt to impose on their listeners. Aline was eager to generalize from his particular conversion experience and to make it the universally accepted evangelical norm. His audacity, some would call it spiritual arrogance, appealed to many Nova Scotians who were confused and disoriented by the divisive forces unleashed by the American Revolution. It should be stressed that according to Aline, the scriptures and his own mystical experience had convincingly showed him that Calvinism was a pernicious heresy. The lesson why those who are lost are not redeemed, he declared, is not because that God delighted in their misery or by any neglect in God, God forbid. Rather, it resulted, as he put it, by the will of the creature, which, instead of consenting to redeeming love, rejects it and therefore cannot possibly be redeemed. Men and devils, he asserted, that are miserable are not only the authors of their own misery, but that against the will of God the nature of God, and the most enduring expression of his love. Aline's radical evangelical and new light message, it is clear, in its essentials at least, reflected what Pro Professor Stephen Marini has sensitively referred to as the distinctive elements of the evangelical tradition, intense conversion experience, fervent piety, ecstatic worship forms, biblical literalism, the pure church ideal, and charismatic leadership. And Marini correctly locates Aline at the heart of this Whitfieldian New Light framework. But there is also, of course, an important heterodox element in the volatile mixture making up Aline's theology. And many of Aline's contemporaries were aware of the potentially explosive nature of his highly mystical theology. In a particularly discerning critique of Aline's theology, the Reverend Matthew Ritchie, a Nova Scotia Methodist, pointed out that the Falmouth preacher's tenets were a singular combination of heterogeneous materials derived from opposite sources. Henry Aline is clear 
was also able to perceive a special purpose for his fellow Nova Scotians in the midst of the disorienting American revolutionary situation. He became, I have argued elsewhere, the charismatic leader of a widespread and intense religious revival which swept the, the colony during the war years. The Great Awakening of Nova Scotia was, without question, one of the most significant social movements in the long history of Nova Scotia. It was, among other things, the means by which a large number of Nova Scotians, especially the so-called Yankees, extricated themselves from the domination of neighboring New England, which they had left a decade or more earlier. By creating a, a compelling ideology that was specifically geared to conditions in the isolated northern colony, Allyne enabled many Nova Scotians to regard themselves as what Gordon Stewart and I called a people highly favored of God. These people were provided by Allyne with a unique history, a distinct identity, and a special destiny. A new sense of Nova Scotia identity, we have argued, had clicked into fragile place to replace the, the, the disintegrating loyalty to New England and the largely undermined loyalty to Old England. But this was not all that Henry Allyne accomplished. At one time I thought that it was. And then I reread his journal. I reread his hymns and spiritual songs, and his two mites, and his anti traditionalists, and his sermons. It is clear to me now that Allyne also preached the simple, emotional, Whitfieldian evangelical gospel of the new birth without its Calvinism, and thus provided a powerful new personal and spiritual relationship between Christ and the redeemed believer in a world where all traditional relationships were falling apart. Allyne was, it is clear, obsessed with the mystical relationship of Christ with regenerate man. And because of this preoccupation, he was able to use his charismatic powers to drill the reality of this insight into the minds and hearts of his thousands of Nova Scotia listeners. He was obviously a man who was obsessed with disintegrating relationships, and one who therefore could relate to his fellow Nova Scotians who too were preoccupied with disintegrating relationships. For Alline, a personal relationship to Christ was the means of resolving all the difficulties arising from a myriad of disintegrating human relationships. Conversion was thus perceived as the short-circuiting of a complex process a short-circuiting which produced instant and immediate satisfaction, solace, and intense relief. Eventually, Alline visited almost every settlement in Nova Scotia, then inhabited by approximately 20,000 people, 60% of whom were recently arrived New Englanders. And Halifax and Lunenburg were the only major centers of the colony unaffected by the revival Alline helped to articulate into existence. The Lunenburg area was peopled by foreign Protestants who understood neither Alline's brand of Christianity nor the patriot ideology of independence. Their loyalty was a mixture of self-interest, indifference, and splendid isolation. In Halifax, economic and military ties with Great Britain, together with the heterogeneous nature of the population and the influence of the elite, created a consensus violently opposed both to revolution and to Henry Alline and his evangelical gospel. Almost single-handedly, Alline was able, by his frequent visits to the settlements, to draw the isolated communities together and to impose upon them a feeling of fragile oneness. They were sharing a common experience, and Alline was providing them with answers to disconcerting and puzzling contemporary questions. For Alline, the Nova Scotia Revival was, among other things, an event of world and cosmic significance. The social, economic, and political backwater that was Nova Scotia had been transformed by the Revival into the new center of the Christian world. Nova Scotia had replaced New England as a city on a hill. It would be quite wrong to stop at this precise moment, as I once did in analyzing Alline's ideology and gospel. Alline's preaching was certainly permeated with, 
with what has been called a peculiar Nova Scotia sense of mission. He was certainly concerned with the special place his fellow colonists had in the cosmic and secular drama then unfolding in the New World. But of greater consequence, as far as Aline was concerned, was individual salvation, bringing Nova Scotians into a deep and personal spiritual relationship with Christ. If one cuts to the heart of Aline's thought and preaching, it is clear that his conceptual framework and, and his rhetoric were surprisingly similar to that put forward by George Whitfield and hundreds of Whitfield's disciples. Of course, in many respects, Aline would go much beyond the Whitfieldian paradigm. He stressed, for example, that, in quotes, all mankind were actually present with Adam. And he refused to believe, in quotes, in the vicarious suffering of the Lord Jesus, end of quote, or in the resurrection of the body. Moreover, he was convinced that God had spoken directly to him and that he had actually, in a flash of insight, actually seen the Almighty. Yet the new birth was the central reality of Aline's preaching and his theology. For Aline, genuine spiritual harmony was produced only by what he described over and over and over again as the ravishing of the soul. If Aline was overwhelmed by one verbal image, it was that of the ravishing of the soul by the Almighty. It was a verbal image, pregnant with dynamic meaning, and one which blended the sexual with the spiritual produced a powerful explosive mixture. Aline drove a variety of evangelical truths into the hearts and minds of his listeners, largely because of his charismatic power. And furthermore, Aline was not afraid of triggering off deep emotional reactions in his listeners. He knew from his own experience that this was the only way to produce a genuine conversion experience. Aline was successful throughout the revolutionary period in cultivating and in sustaining the image of a supernaturally endowed charismatic leader. This was no mean accomplishment for a man who until the age of 27 was widely regarded as a chief contriver and ringleader of the frolics in the Falmouth area. Almost overnight, Aline was transformed into a spellbinding preacher, a controversial essayist, and an unusually gifted hymn writer. Until 1820 in New England, Aline's hymns were almost as popular as those of Isaac Watts and were frequently reprinted in hymnals which were widely used in the Second Great Awakening in New England. Unfortunately, Canadian Baptists have been unwilling to follow the Yankee example. You can't find a Haline hymn anywhere. That is interesting, and perhaps worthy of yet another series of lectures. <laughs> it should also be kept in mind that Henry Aline adhered to no one particular church. He had no formal education. His family owned a marginal farm and possessed little social status. He therefore cannot be identified as a leader who derived his authority from traditional institutions or from traditional ideas. He and his followers insisted that his authority was derived from his close personal relationship with the Almighty. His ascendancy in the old settlements of Nova Scotia and later in northern New England was unprecedented and was not soon emulated. After 1783, a whole host of evangelical preachers, many of them Baptists like Thomas Hanley Chipman, Theodore and Harris Harding, Joseph Dimmick and the Mannings, Edward and James, traversed the colony, but none would attain the unique exclusiveness in leadership established by Henry Aline. But they tried. Some tried very hard indeed. Aline died of tuberculosis in New Hampshire in the early morning of February the 2nd, 1784. He had made his way to New England to bring back to the land of his birth the pristine purity of the Christian gospel. Aline left behind him in Nova Scotia only a fragile church organizational structure and only one ordained new light minister. With his death, the movement he had played a key role in shaping threatened to fall apart. Enthusiasm without organizational discipline and without Aline's special brand of charismatic leadership merely led to exhaustion, confusion, and doubt. Only slowly, 
Would his Nova Scotia disciples be able to breathe new life into the old Whitfieldian gospel as they began to try to transform what to some had become antinomian new lights into disciplined Baptists? For this process would be a difficult and frustrating one, and success would only come after much, much soul-searching and much failure. Just before he died in New Hampshire in February of 1784, Alline gave to the Reverend David McClure, the Congregational Church Minister at Northampton, his manuscript journal, some of which was still written in the form of shorthand. Before his death, Alline had expressed the desire to have the remarkable providences of God towards him made public for the good of souls. And McClure urged Alline's father to find some judicious person who was acquainted with the characters of which, in which he wrote to undertake this vitally important project. Alline's father was assured of the fact that his son had been a burning and shining light in Nova Scotia and elsewhere and that his Christian virtues, zeal, fortitude, faith, hope, patience, and resignation shone bright as the lamp of light, as the lamp of light burnt down into the socket. Alline's journal was not actually published until 1806, but it is clear that manuscript versions of the journal, as I mentioned earlier, were circulating in Nova Scotia as early as 1789. These manuscript journals were laboriously copied as they were passed from community to community and from New Light family to New Light family. And in the process, Alline's journal became both a source of inspiration to his followers and also a guidebook for mystical and evangelical behavior. Alline's experiences were therefore as important, if not more important, than his somewhat opaque and difficult theology. Nova Scotians and later New Englanders could relate to Alline as a person, very much like themselves. He was one of them, and every line in his journal emphatically underscored this fact. If he could experience spiritual ecstasy, then they could. If he could be ravished by the Holy Spirit, they could. If he could recover from his intense, morbid introspection, then they could. If an uneducated tanner and farmer in his late 20s and early 30s, could help to coax into existence a widespread religious awakening, then they could as well. Elline, in a very real sense, became a symbol and a popular hero. His life was convincing proof that with God, all things were indeed possible. Elline's journal, in my view, is a remarkable document. And unlike Professor Gordon Stewart, I find it both exciting and evocative. In fact, I consider it to be one of the two or three most illuminating, honest, introspective accounts available concerning the spiritual travails of any 18th century North American mystical evangelical. The journal, in other words, is not only a significant historical document within the context of Nova Scotia development, but also within the matrix of American religious life and society. Alline's Alline, therefore, it seems clear to me, merits more than mere parochial interest and attention. Alline's Alline may confidently be located in the mainstream of North American religious history. Alline's conversion experience in March of 1775 had been extraordinarily traumatic and intensely mystical. Alline had at last been willing, as he put it, to bow to him, to be ruled by him, to submit to him, and to depend wholly upon him, both for time and eternity. This was the antithesis of his Yankee Calvinism. Alline delighted in bravely spitting the words, free grace, free grace, into the prevailing winds of predestination still strong blowing across Yankee Nova Scotia. Instead of doubt, confusion, inner turmoil, Alline found that his whole soul was filled with love and ravished with the divine ecstasy beyond any doubts or fears or thoughts of being then deceived. He knew that he now enjoyed a heaven on earth, and it seemed as if he were wrapped up in God, a God who, according to Alline, had done 10,000 times more for me than I ever could expect or any thought of. Alline went on to describe in powerful imagery the climax of his conversion. 
Looking up, I thought I saw that same light, though it appeared different. As soon as I saw it, the design was open to me according to his promise, and I was obliged to cry out, Enough, enough, O blessed God! The work of conversion, the change, and the manifestations of it are no more disputable than that light which I see or anything that I ever saw. Oh, how the condescension melted me and, and thought I could hardly bear that God should stoop so low to such an unworthy wretch, crying out still, Enough, enough, oh my God! I believe, I believe. At the same time, I was ravished with his love and saying, Go on, go on, blessed God, and love and mercy to me. And although I do not deserve thee, yet I cannot live without thee. I long to drink deeper and deeper of thy love. Oh, what secret pleasure I enjoyed. Less than an hour later, the Lord Alline explained, discovered to me my labor in the ministry and called me to preach the gospel. God has spoken to him directly from the 40th Psalm. The Almighty had put a new song in his mouth containing the glad tidings of salvation and messages of peace to my fellow men. Alline had been chosen to preach the gospel at a crucial turning point in his life and the collective life of Nova Scotians. God had realized that Alline was an unlikely candidate. His, in quotes, capacity in the world was low, being obliged to labor daily with my hands to get a living. His parents were old, and Alline, in quotes, had the whole care of these temporal concerns. Moreover, Alline's education, as he cogently expressed it, was but small. Yet Alline felt a powerful call to preach the evangelical gospel he had so recently experienced firsthand. In late March of 1775, there was no fork in the road just ahead. There's only one road for Alline, and that led to the evangelization of Nova Scotia and perhaps neighboring New England. Alline was the, in the Almighty's instrument to bring about fundamental change in Nova Scotia. He'd been ravished by his blessed Redeemer. He had appropriated a divine ecstasy and had been wrapped up in the Almighty in a profoundly moving mystical experience. Not only had Alline experienced God directly through the scriptures, but he had also, for an eternal moment, almost felt the divine essence and seen the Spirit and heard the still, small voice of God. In other words, his conversion experience witnessed the blending of a rich variety of stimuli. He, as he put it, saw the Word of God in the Bible, and the Word overwhelmed him penetrating in the deepest recesses of his being. He heard God speaking directly to him, and he could not resist the appeal of this message. But even more than this, Alline actually felt Jesus Christ enter his life, and the only way he could attempt to describe the intense ecstasy involved was by using sexual imagery. It was not enough for Alline to be ecstatically converted, and this point needs to be emphasized. His conversion, obviously, was the means whereby the spiritual and the carnal aspects of his being were integrated, and the new birth provided him, moreover, with an intense personal relationship with Christ, which renewed and revitalized personal relationships which he had felt had been disintegrating. But the 27-year-old Tanner Farmer was eager to declare his complete independence of his parents, and only becoming a full-time itinerant preacher would accomplish this goal. Alline, though in his middle twenties, was still regarded as a dependent child by his father, who ordered him to family prayers, who stressed the fact the oldest son had a special obligation to care for his aging parents. Alline felt a powerful need to escape the clutches of his parents, the parents he both adored and feared. His father represented the vindictive Calvinist God Henry had rejected, and this rejection was at the core of Alline's newfound sense of mature identity. On experiencing his new birth, Alline had felt a great need to share his newfound spiritual ecstasy with his parents. Surrounded by the arms of everlasting love, as he once explained it, and happily resting in the arms of redeeming love, he rushed down to his parents at sunrise to declare to them the miracle of God's unbounded grace to me. In this act, Alline was both asserting his independence and his dependence. The first time in his life, Alline explained to his parents what the Bible actually taught about the love and condescension of an infinite God, and then also 
For the first time, he led the morning prayers to the delight and amazement of his parents. I'd never been heard to speak even one word of my own standing, he observed, nor ever known to pray either in public or in private. Yet Aline was afraid to tell his parents about his decision, in quotes, to preach, keeping that in my own mind. The new birth was something his parents could quite happily accept, regarding it as an integral part of their Yankee congregationalism. But any decision on his part to challenge the traditional role of the educated ministry was anathema to his mother and father. Looking back at his, at his procrastination, Aline once commented, I have since thought it was the work of the devil to keep it concealed, for it kept me back from public improvement longer than perhaps otherwise I might have done. It caused me to pass many a sorrowful hour not knowing what to do, I having no one to tell my mind to or ask advice from who perhaps might have been instrumental in God's hand of helping me out and showing me the way of duty. While he pondered his fate and tried to summon sufficient courage to cut his future from his parents' present and past, Aline found great pleasure in walking over the dike land in private for hours and hours, where he conversed with God oftentimes as with an intimate friend and feasted on his love. These conversations, however, did not help Aline resolve his dilemma but what he referred to as his call to the ministry. Throughout the April 1775 to May 1776 period, Aline could think of little or nothing else but preaching his unique brand of new like Christianity. At first, he was satisfied with merely witnessing to his close friends, people like his brother-in-law, John Paisan. Gradually, however, the glorious work of God began to spread in that dark land as Aline deflected his youthful enthusiasm of his young, frolicking friends into religious introspection. As the revival or the new light stir spread, Aline felt himself under increasing pressure, as he put it, to come out and attempt to speak in public. He felt that, in quotes, would have been very easy for me, believing that God would go with me, yet Aline was also painfully aware of the prejudices of education, the strong ties of tradition, which so chained me down that I could not think myself qualified for it without having a great deal of human learning. A desperate ally, fearful that the prime of his days would be over before being employed in the cause of Christ, finally summoned enough courage to talk about his problem with one of his brother, brothers-in-law, probably John Paisant. He wanted his brother-in-law to prod him into preaching, but Paisant, who was also on the chains respecting human learning, merely advised Aline to apply myself immediately to reading and studying until some door opened to me to attain to more learning. Feeling in October 1775 that he had been directed by the Holy Spirit to proceed to New England to get learning there, Aline made his way to Cornwallis, from where a vessel was to sail shortly for Boston. Aline carefully avoided telling his parents why he was going to Massachusetts. According to them, he was sailing there in order to see relatives and also to flee from the aggressive British press gangs. It is remarkable that Aline, at this crucial turning point in his life, was carefully hiding his real motivation from his parents. He obviously was intimidated by them and by the religious values which they symbolized. Here was a man, almost 28 years old, who had been traumatized only months before by an intense conversion experience, who could not tell his parents that he had to return to New England in order to be properly educated there for the Christian ministry. Did deference, intimidation, and fear account for Aline's peculiar behavior? Some would call it dishonesty. Why was the man who had experienced firsthand the ecstasies of joy, praising and adoring the ancient of days for his free and abounded grace, as Aline put it, so reluctant to explain his real feelings to his parents? There are so many answers to these questions. It seems that Alan, like many children, could not express openly his deepest anxieties to his parents. There's a communications gap that he felt incapable of bridging, and moreover, he intuitively feared that his mother and father, fully aware of his shortcomings and vulnerabilities and powerfully attached to congregational traditionalism, would emphatically criticize and reject his decision to become a minister of the gospel. 
To avoid this anticipated rejection, Aline would tell them nothing about his real reasons for going to Boston. Once properly educated, he could then return to Nova Scotia with his New England learning, assuage his parents, and serve as Redeemer at the same time. The late autumn of 1775, Aline waited in Cornwallis for the ship to set sail for Boston. The vessel was seized, in quotes, and its owners decided to delay the voyage until the spring of the following year. Aline could not be certain if the delay had been brought about by the devil or by the Almighty. <laughs> and an outbreak of an epidemic of smallpox in the Falmouth region only served to add to his anxiety and his guilt as did mounting societal pressure on him to become active in the local militia. During the winter months of 1775 and 1776, Aline's views regarding education and the Christian ministry underwent a revolutionary change. By April 14, 1776, Aline at last felt that he could declare his independence of his parents and all that they represented. News about the Anglo-American conflict in the 13 colonies had persuaded Aline that returning to New England to be educated there no longer made much sense. Moreover, the news triggered in Aline what the Falmouth Tanner described as God's breaking into my soul with the revivals of his grace, the sweetness of his love. The Almighty revealed to Aline the vanity of all things here below and the worth of souls, which gave me much such a longing desire to go forth with the gospel and proclaim the Redeemer's name that my soul cried out, Send me, send me, send me, O Lord God, in thy blessed name, and take away all honor and the glory of the cross and all the commissions, but a commission from heaven to go forth and enlist my fellow mortals to fight under the banner of King Jesus. My soul rejoices to take it for my whole portion while on this mortal stage. Christ and not George III or the Patriots alone merited unquestioning allegiance, and Aline was determined to be involved not in what he called the inhuman civil war, but in the cosmic battle then raging between his Redeemer and the minions of the devil. And the Anglo-American crisis helped to shape Aline's resolve to preach the gospel, as did some strong advice from yet another of his brothers-in-law. Finally, on April the 18th, being a day set apart for fasting and prayer in his local church, Aline met with a small group of worshipers and for the first time came out and spoke by way of exhortation. Though he felt some liberty, he also experienced acute anxiety, wondering whether he had made a fool of himself and had disgraced his Savior. But what made matters even worse for Aline was the realization that his preaching, in quotes, was not agreeable, as he put it to his parents. Thinking that he was, in fact, under a delusion, his mother and father left the house of worship when he was speaking. Oh, how it would cut me sometimes, Aline confessed. The greatest trials I met were, with, were from my parents, who were so much against my improving, end of quote. But despite their overt criticism, Aline persevered, preaching to his friends and neighbors every Sabbath day. As he put it, being sometimes in the dark and sometimes in the light, when I was in darkness and did not find the Spirit of God with me, when speaking I would be ready to sink and thought I would preach no more, when I got life and liberty again, my strength and my resolutions were renewed, and thus God dealt with me and carried me through various scenes. One of the most important scenes without question was the enthusiastic acceptance on the part of Aline's parents of his role as preacher of the gospel. They were as much engaged for me to preach the gospel, he proudly declared, as I was, and would have plucked out even their eyes for my encouragement. Aline now felt himself lifted above, above the fears and trials of the world. He had finally been able to declare his independence of his parents, and they, in a fascinating reversal of roles, began to display a growing deference to and dependence on their son. Buoyed by this acceptance and driven by a conviction that he had only a limited time to spend on this veil of tears, Aline was determined to preach his gospel in every settlement in Nova Scotia. News that Henry Aline was turned new light preacher drew scores of visitors to Falmouth. Some came to hear what the babbler had to say, Aline reported. 
Some came with gladness of heart that God had raised up one to speak in his name, and some came to make a scoff, but it did not seem to trouble me much, for I trust God was with me and supported and enabled me to face a frowning world. By early November of 1776, Ally noted in the Falmouth Horton area that the Lord was reviving a work of grace. Throughout December of 1776, in the early months of 1777, Allied itinerated in the Cornwallis, Horton, Newport area, the, rich, the region he knew best in the colony. When opposition to his preaching created unanticipated problems in the Cornwallis area in May, Allied decided to visit Annapolis, where he saw little evidence of the power of religion. When he returned to Cornwallis, Allied confronted two Presbyterian ministers who inquired after my right to preach. Allied replied that his authority was from heaven and he was immediately attacked for preaching without a license. <laughs> Aline was moreover criticized, and that's a direct quote, Aline was moreover criticized for breaking through all order. When the two Presbyterian ministers discovered that Aline was stubbornly established in my sentiments and not easily uh, moved, they began to be more moderate, to advise me, making me an offer of their library, and what assistance they could give me, if I would leave off preaching until I was a little better qualified. In reply, Ally, in quotes, told them the Lord knew before he called me how unqualified I was as to human learning, and as he had called me, I trusted he would qualify me for whatever he had for me to do. Besides, Ally continued, the work of God was the prospering in my hands, and therefore I did not dare to desert it. There was in particular a considerable stir among many of the young people, in the Newport, Falmouth, Hort, Horton area. Great number met almost every evening, he noted, and continued until 11 and 12 o'clock at night, praying, exhorting, singing, some of them telling what God had done for their souls, and some groaning under a load of sin. After visiting Annapolis early in August, Aline returned to Cornwallis and into Falmouth, which he left late in October for Newport. In November, he was back in Cornwallis, and on November the 20th, he rode off to visit Wilmot, where he found the Spirit of God still troubling the waters and some souls happy, despite the very high opposition, especially from the minister of that place and many of his church. Oh, the damage that is done by unconverted ministers, Aline complained, and legal professors. <laughs> I guess Acadia doesn't have a, a law school. I have found them in my travels, he went on, more inveterate against the power of religion than the openly profane. In February of 1778, Aline experienced his first long black night of despair and doubt. The horror of darkness engulfed him, and the strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. He movingly described the darkness and distress of his mind and conscience. This was the first distress, darkness, or doubt of my standing that ever I had known since my conversion. For now I gave way to the enemy, it being new to me, so that I wholly doubted my standing, that I tried to invalidate all the evidences I had since my conversion of having enjoyed the presence of God to throw it all away. Yet I found something like an anchor of hope within the veil, which I could not get rid of. Though I tried much and prayed to God to take it away, Oh, the unspeakable distress I was under. I could neither eat, drink, nor sleep with any satisfaction, for it was wholly new to me, that I knew not what to do, what to say, where I had been, where I was now, nor where I was going. Oh, my soul cried out to some unknown God, help me, help me, oh my God, if thou art mine, if not, oh my God, undeceive me. For three days and three nights, as Jonah was, Aline found himself in the belly of hell, as he put it. He had tumbled from the mountain peak of ravishing ecstasy, the bottom of the mountains and the earth with their bars surrounded him. Just when he seemed to be devoid of redeeming faith, the Almighty, in quotes, remembered me and brought me uh, again to rejoice in the wonders of his love to triumph over the powers of darkness, end of quote. When Aline was delivered from the hell of his intense doubt, he experienced unspeakable happiness, was convinced it was all in great love, yea, of unspeakable benefit to fit me for the work I had before me, which God knew, though I did not. Aline's was an amazing and honest admission of agonizing doubt. 
He was not afraid to scrape into the inner recesses of his faith and to declare to posterity both his vulnerability and his integrity. This basic and almost transparent honesty and openness helps to explain Alline's tremendous appeal. Nova Scotians obviously could empathize with him and resonate with the wild oscillations of his feelings. Throughout the summer and autumn months of 1778, as he itinerated up and down the Annapolis Valley, Alline sadly noted that the awakenings he had helped spark into existence were often quickly followed by periods of spiritual declension and sectarian conflict. He found the activities of the Baptists in the Horton area particularly annoying with their disputes about such non-essentials as water baptism. When in January of 1779, the Cornwallis Congregational Church offered to ordain Alline, he reacted by stressing the fact that he could never be settled in any one place, for I would rather stand wholly alone in the world than go contrary to the gospel. For Alline, going contrary to the gospel meant refusing to itinerate as the Spirit directed him. On the 6th of April, Alline was ordained in a large barn in Cornwallis as an itinerant minister. After prayer and singing and a sermon preached, he received the imposition of hands by nine delegates, three chosen out of each church from Cornwallis, Horton, and Falmouth, Newport. In late April of 1779, Alline sailed from Cornwallis to the St. John River, where in the Majorville area the work of the Blessed God increased and Alline was able to breathe new life into a disintegrating church. On his return to the mouth of the river to present-day St. John, he was depressed with the darkness of the place. The greatest part of the people, he noted, conducted as if they were to die like beasts. I suppose, he went on, there were upwards 200 people there come to the years of maturity, and I saw no signs of any Christian excepting one soldier. Sometime in June, Alain sailed to Annapolis, where he, in quotes, found the work of God in some degree reviving, some in distress, and in some sense of their danger, but he also discovered that one of his early converts was, spread, was spreading rather malicious rumors about Alline's sexual life. The Falmouth preacher, it was asserted, had been seen in bed with a young woman, and Alline was now looked on with some coldness. Eventually, Alline's accuser confessed that he had told a lie and had been imposed upon by the devil in his own malicious nature. Though he had never before endured such bitter calumny, Alline learned to pay no regard to false reports and used the occasion to trigger a revival of religion. There was such, there was much travailing in the pangs of the new birth. In many nights he sat up until twelve, one, two, and three o'clock, laboring with distressed souls, as he put it in his journal. When he returned to his home base in July, Alline discovered a new kind of distress produced by the enemy getting in among the Christians in warm debate and sowing discord about non-essential matters, especially water baptism. The vain disputes were such that Alline resolved in August to escape by riding down to Annapolis. En route, he penned the following brief poetic prayer. Take me, send me, O thou indulgent God, to spread the blessed Redeemer's love abroad. Send me, O God, the gospel trump the blow to mortals dead in sin and doomed to woe, that they may know thy love before too late they ruin darkness, their eternal state. By November, Alline was back in Annapolis, where he enjoyed great liberal liberality in the gospel, despite growing an often vociferous opposition. He spent December, January, and February in the Cornwallis Falmouth region, where he noted the Lord seemed to be reviving his work again. After many of his sermons, some of his audience would arise, exhort, and witness for God. Exhorting became an integral part of Alline's worship service. Let me stress this point. Men and women were encouraged to witness to their faith, but they were encouraged to do more than merely witness. They were urged to personalize Alline's evangelistic message, to dissect it into meaningful segments, and then bombard their friends with these verbal, verbal-powered projections. Projections which, in a sense, took upon themselves an aura of divine inspiration. Alline's message was thus powerfully reinforced, and the prisms of the exhorter's enthusiasm redirected in a myriad of directions. 
In early March of 1780, Aline set out for Annapolis yet once again, this time on snowshoes, accompanied by a young man who carried his saddlebags. Aline was planning to spend six months in the Annapolis region and the St. John River Valley. He found up the St. John River that the work of God was not so powerful as it once been and around Annapolis that there were stultifying and divisive disputes about water baptism, bitter disputes, which would affect the entire Annapolis Valley. On returning to Cornwallis in July, one month early, an exasperated Aline felt compelled to unburden his soul for what he conceived to be the increasingly pernicious debate about water baptism. Oh, how much advantage does the enemy get in the minds of Christians by those zealous disputes about non-essentials, making that the chief subject of their discourses when the essentials of or work of God is neglected. I've often observed in the short compass of my ministry that when the Christians get much of the life of religion with the love of God in their souls, those small matters were scarcely talked of. But whenever they met their discourse was about the work of God in the heart and what God had done for their souls, inviting sinners to come to Christ and setting forth in their conversation the important truths of the gospel. But as soon as religious, but as soon as religion grows cold, then they sit hours and hours discoursing about those things which would never be of service to body or soul and proving the validity of their own method or form of some external matter and condemn others who do not think as they do. Aline has perceptively realized that in the white heat of revival, non-essentials were seldom talked about. But when the revival fires went out, then peripheral issues became central ones. Small differences became matters of principle, and a profound sense of Christian oneness was replaced by what Aline called sectarian zeal. Aline detested, it is clear, sectarian bickering about non-essentials, and he longed for the love of the meek and lowly Jesus to burn up and expel the all-too-pervasive stuff and darkness which he saw was putting a break on the revival movement. By November, Aline returned, had returned to his home base where uh, a lot of his time and energy was once again spent on, met, on, on settling internal matters of dispute. Then in early December, he visited the darkness and death of Halifax for the first time to commit a small piece of my writings to the press. The small piece was his hymns and spiritual songs or a variety of pleasing on, on a variety of pleasing and important subjects a 24-page collection of 22 of his recently composed hymns and spiritual songs. The remainder of December was spent in Horton and Cornwallis, where once again, Aline found himself embroiled in heated debates about what he regarded as non-essentials. For the first seven months of 1781, Aline oscillated wildly between the sweetness of that peace beyond what tongue can tell and the great darkness produced by the absence of my Lord and Master, as he put it. Despite his spiritual turmoil, he continued to preach, hoping thereby to recapture the pristine purity of his faith. He was also writing his major treatise, Two Mites, which in late March he delivered to his Halifax printer, A. Henry. Aline's acute morbid introspection of 1781 was probably shaped by four important factors. First, Aline was writing a major theological work and literary creativity of this kind often produces introspection and self-doubt. Second, he was feeling the early effects of tuberculosis, a disease which would, which would result in his early death three years later. It is well known that alternating states of euphoria and depression have always characterized those suffering from consumption, as has what has been called a self-driving behavior. Third, he desperately wanted to be married, to have a female friend, as he, put, uh, as he put it, to lean upon. But he also felt it necessary to surrender all up to God, let what may come. And fourth, Aline, for the first time in his ministry, was confronted by ruffians and military officers who threatened him with physical abuse and who, with drawn swords, cursed and blasphemed him. There was much mocking and hooting as the British soldiers from neighboring Windsor intimidated the famous Yankee neutral preacher, as he was then called. It is not surprising, therefore, that Aline would plaintively observe 
in July, yea, I found by what trials and persecutions I went through that it was hard to have the mind in such a frame as to suffer wholly for Christ. On July the 7th, perhaps in order to escape from an environment which seemed to produce too much morbid introspection, Allied sailed for the Chignecco Isthmus region of Nova Scotia. Here among the Yorkshire and Cumberland Methodists and Yankees, he was, as he put it, blessed with a longing desire to spend and to be spent in his blessed cause. On July, Alline was back at Horton after escaping en route from a patriot privateer. Let them that wish well to their souls flee from privateers as they would from the jaws of hell, he stressed. For me, thinks a privateer may be called a floating hell. Alline found that Christ was once again all my joy. Jesus, my Lord, I call thee mine. I feel thy word that makes me thine. Now on me gird the gospel sword with the whole armor of thy word to spread the wonders of thy grace abroad. But Alline was disappointed with the dead people who came out to hear him, and he felt that his message, as he puts it, seems to slip by them without any more impression on them than water upon glass. What a contrast with Cumberland, and Alline looked longingly at the Yarmouth Liverpool corner of the colony where I never had been. Perhaps here, as he put it, there would be a sweetness of laboring in Christ's kingdom. In October, Alline arrived via a small boat near present-day Yarmouth. Here he faced a furious Reverend Jonathan Scott, the congregational minister who raged very high against Alline, regarding him as a dangerous interloper. After visiting Argyle briefly, Alline made his way to Barrington, finding the inhabitants there very dark, and then he sailed to Liverpool, where he finally arrived after being captured by an American privateer on December the 11th. At Liverpool, he found a kind people, but in midnight darkness, and vastly given to frolicking, rioting, and all manner of levity. Early in June of 82, Alline was back in the Chignecto region, and early July in Cumberland to the east. And then in July, Alline sailed to present-day Prince Edward Island, where he found, as he put it, only three Christians among a very dark people who are openly profane. <laughs> Two weeks later, Alline was back on Nova Scotia's soil, this time at Pictou, on Northumberland Strait. Early in August, near Truro, Alline had a bitter confrontation with two more Presbyterian ministers, Reverends Cock and Smith, who called him a strange imposter, neither college learned nor authorized by the presbytery. <laughs> then on August the 20th, Alline resolved to return to his home, but before he could, he was obstructed by a sudden turn of illness, which incapacitated him for a week. On recovering, he found himself involved with one of the Presbyterian ministers in an especially acrimonious debate concerning original sin, predestination, and the incarnation all of which themes Alline had dealt with in his controversial book, The Two Mites. According to Alline, of course, he had won the debate, and he was therefore inspired to write on the 1st of September, 1782, O Jesus, give me strength of thine to spread this lovely name of thine while mortal life remains. Then shall I make thy name my song amongst the blessed immortal throng in heaven's exalted strains. Two days later, Alline was back in Falmouth. On January the 1st, 1783, Alline sailed to Halifax, where he stayed for 10 days. He still found that Haligonians in general are almost as dark as, and as vile as in Sodom. He returned to Liverpool for a, brief, for a brief sojourn, where he saw the waters troubled and souls stepping in. He then spent the first two weeks of March in Halifax and made his way overland to Falmouth. On the 26th of March at Windsor, he was taken so ill that my life was despaired of. During most of April, May, June, and July, he remained gravely ill and was thought by almost everyone that I would soon quit this mortal stage. During his prolonged sickness, Alline was in, in, in divine rapture, expecting imminently to return to paradise. He slowly regained his strength, and as he recovered, he became increasingly convinced that God was calling him to New England. It is impossible to be certain about Alline's motivation for visiting New England. He felt a powerful attraction, as he put it, to go and proclaim my master's name where I never had preached, especially since Alline had already preached almost all over Nova Scotia. Expecting to die at any minute, 
the Falmouth preacher felt compelled to return to his homeland in the hope of persuading the Yankees to return to the evangelical faith of their fathers, a faith that Alline possessed in its pristine simplicity and which he was also enthusiastically preaching. Alline, moreover, in the summer of 1783, knew that he was dying, and he evidently wanted to die in New England. But before he died there, he first wanted, as he put it, to blow the gospel trump. His parents encouraged him to go, expecting to meet him again only in heaven. His friends knew that nothing they said or did could dissuade Alline from doing what he was convinced was the will of God. On August the 27th, Alline sailed from Windsor, and after an unplanned stop on the most of the St. John River, reached northern Maine early in September. He would never return to Nova Scotia, to, now, to what he now described as his native province. He left behind him scores of disciples, hundreds of followers, and a spiritual legacy reflected in both the oral and written traditions of the religious culture of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. That is my Alline's Alline. Uh, some of you may feel that there was too much detail there from the journal. I wanted to insert that so that you get a feel of Henry Alline the man, how he responded to Nova Scotia and Nova Scotians, and why. And I would hope that uh, some of the excerpts I have read will persuade you and go out and buy the Journal of Henry Alline, uh, edited by um, J. Beverly and Barry Moody, uh, produced in the Baptist Heritage Series. Um, I think what I'm trying to say t today is that I consider that journal to be one of the most important 18th century documents. Not only is it an important 18th century document, it's also a very important 20th century document. Thank you.